Hello, I'm Dr. Jeanette Haynes from New Mexico State University. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction in the College of Education. And today I'll be speaking on behalf of the National Multicultural Interpreters Project to di discuss some of the diversity issues among Native American populations and look at some of the diversity within my own tribal group. I am uh, Zalagi, or otherwise known as Cherokee, and from northeastern Oklahoma, around Tulsa. And so what I will say is I am fourth generation born in Oklahoma. And in a moment I'll tell you a little bit more about what that means. And in working with Native American clients, there's uh, various issues to discuss. And so how I will start that off is to tell you a little bit more about the diversity within my own tribe to give you a better idea of dealing with perhaps clients from Native American communities. Uh, in talking about sign language, it has had a very important part in Native American cultures. It was historically a very important and viable means of communicating among tribes. And then after contact with non-Indians, it was also very important. So historically, it has a, a very good place. Um, when we're looking at some of the sign language I was shared, it was shared with me that this means Indian or the, I guess, perhaps resorting back to the color of skin. Somehow, or one may look at that as being um, somewhat stereotypical, because when one thinks of an Indian person, what do you think of? You think of perhaps the features. You think of maybe it's determined upon last names. But oftentimes, it is that physical appearance, that skin color, is what we think of when we try to determine if someone is Native American. So what I would like to think about or discuss today is what is being Indian. And I want to look at issues of identity. And how I'll do that is to explain my own tribal background to you. Um, some of the terms that are used when working with Native people, we hear various terms such as Native American, American Indian, Indian, um, also indigenous people, and then the Canadian groups are referred to as First Nations. So we have again that indigenous quality. And these terms are correct and you will find that depending upon where you are, what region of the country, those terms may be used differently. And when I speak, I use them interchangeably because oftentimes I find if you use just one term, it implies that we're all the same and we are many, many different nations. So um, oftentimes you'll find some of the people older than myself using the term American Indian, but I prefer Native American. What I would like to do is go ahead and start with my own tribal history and to tell you a bit about where we started from and now where we are now. Um, originally, we are known as Zalagi, or, or as the principal people is how we refer to ourselves, And that has somewhat an ethnocentric quality to it, but on most tribes you have the term for yourself and everyone else is, is on the periphery but that's how we saw ourselves. Uh, the earliest known point of origin was in the Great Lakes area. We were up there uh, and then we were more or less kind of thrown out of what was known as the Iroquois Confederacy after we had some battles with the Delaware, moved into the Ohio Valley and then onto the southeast to where upon the point of contact, that's where we were in the states of Tennessee, Georgia, Alabama, 
North Carolina, South Carolina, Kentucky, and that southeastern region of the United States. When we look at um, also the term Cherokee, that was probably a term that was changed around the time DeSoto entered the southeastern part of the country in the 1540s. So we see some terminology changing at that point. Um, linguistically, we're Iroquoian. We also share some of their characteristics like being matrilineal, which means that your relatives are determined from your mother's side. That is how you're your status and your relatives are determined. We're also matrilocal in uh, the traditional society. Matrilocal meaning that when one married, you moved into the house of your wife or your wife's mother. So in a sense, that was a good thing for women because it allowed for a sense of protection. You didn't see the abuse situations now because you were in a house of women. Um, being in the southeastern region, we were mountain people, and we had a very large bounty there. Um, very, um, we had a lot of deer, bear, different animals to, to give us sustenance. We also had a lot of fish, a lot of turtles, and we, you will find that within our culture, the turtle has a lot of significance in some of the ceremonies and what is done. I remember my father telling me a story of his grandmother, how she would be so excited when the, the kids would come back from fishing and if they had a snapping turtle, she'd run out there to the gate to meet them with her ax and take care of the turtle and she'd boil it and then roll it the meat in cornmeal and fry it up and she said that that was quite a, a tasty meal and it was significant because she said the turtle was made out of seven different animals and you also find that the number seven, the number four has significance within various tribes. And so also within the mountain region, we had nuts and berries and, and other uh, food supplies like that. The people lived in what was called tribal towns. There was a community center or the, the tribal house then, tribal council house, in which was the center where all the people would come in. It was a form of government. So you didn't see one unified uh, Cherokee Nation government, but determining on where the tribal towns were, that was a centralized government. It was a community center for the people. When we look at um, our traditional way of life, you see that we were a clan-based society. The clan system was you inherited your own clan through that clan of your mother. And so we had a number of clans and that also determined your social status, uh, inheritance of perhaps property because the women had communal gardens and were the agricultural, agriculturalists within society. With that clan system, it also gave roles or where one would sit in, uh, in terms of our stomp dance. A lot of people are familiar with powwows and have seen that as the Native American type of social event or dance event, but that is more of a plains type of dance. Uh, it's a social event now that other tribes are taking on, but for us, we had the stomp dance. And what that was, it had spiritual meaning for us. And it was where our community, you would have a male singer, then you had have others follow and, and perform the singing with him. Women had a unique role there. They would wear the turtle shells, again, the turtle being significant. The turtle shells lined up and attached to each other from their knees to their ankles. And in these turtle shells were small pebbles. And the women were called shell shakers. So when the dance was being performed, the women would scoot their feet along and, and provide kind of a rhythm for the singing, a very beautiful shaking shell song. And, um, and keep that, that rhythm going for, for the singers, the dancers. Because one's relatives are through their mother, we see that the children also belong to her. And if there was an event such as divorce, in which there was in Cherokee society, the children always stayed with her. The 
father was not the most instrumental person in the lives of the children, but rather perhaps the male influence was the mother's brother. He would take that role and have a lot of interaction with the children. And we see with that situation, that clan influence, that it all stayed within the mother's family on socializing and raising the children. Women were quite prominent in Cherokee society, and you can see that with the influence of Shelu, who was the, in, in fact, the first mother or the giver of life. So we see the, the spiritual figures or the cultural figures being women. We also see in Cherokee society in terms of governance that women had a strong voice. Um, the older women or the clan mothers had a lot of influence on who would be the leaders among the men in the community. The women would in a sense elect that person and if they did not fulfill the expectations of the community, the women could also take him out. So there was a lot of influence in some ways more than what we see today. The women, as I said, were the agriculturalists in the community. The men did bring in uh, such things as meat and, and the main staples, but the women also had a part in that economy, so they were very important. They were not over men, but complementary to men. Although when DeSoto came in, we did have contact with the Spanish, there wasn't a lot of cultural change at that point. The identity among the people was quite unified. There wasn't a question really on who was or was not Cherokee. But on the contact with whites such as the German, the Irish, the English, the Scots, when they came in we started seeing a change in what was our traditional society, a change in the family system. No longer did we have when people married moving into the women's house or the house of the women's mothers. We now saw that extended family stop and go into a nuclear family. A house was built separately and the women moved in there with, with their new marriage partners. Um, after that, with the onslaught of children coming, then we started seeing a change in identity or the tribal makeup. What we started seeing then was the children being more or less the property of the non-Indian fathers. And so what happened was European religions became more important. The language was certainly changed to English. We also saw children being schooled in European ways. A lot of children were sent back east to the eastern schools eventually to be educated. So we saw a change in culture and what was important. To, to raise the children in a certain type of, of uh, environment. At first this wasn't a problem because if your mother was Cherokee, then you were Cherokee. But eventually we started seeing a change in that as the white or, or European-based society was given more value. So that is when our identity started changing. It was also important to note that at this time, the social class system was introduced because you now had perhaps inheritance from the, the non-Indian fathers such as land or business and that was given on to the children so the establishment of social classes was then introduced. This change in lifestyle also changed Cherokee economy which was an agriculturalist type of society. It changed it into a, a market economy. So that also had an impact on identity. Eventually, when um, upon contact, we saw the difference in the role of women because in Cherokee society where they had a lot of say in the government, when the, the non-Indians first came in, they looked around and said, well, these people, they have a petticoat government because the women are involved because in the European society, the women weren't involved in such issues. And that's one perspective. The native people, the Cherokee people, couldn't understand it because women had always been involved. And when they came there, they were asked, where are your women? 
Were you not born of women? So we to see two different perspectives on, on what is right in, in the government or the, uh, the historical issues of self-government. Um, eventually, the Cherokees started adopting different white uh, ways or lifestyles. And this came from the mixed blood generations. And eventually, the Cherokee developed their own constitution or government somewhat or very close to the federal government in a sense of the constitution. And the Cherokee Nation developed its own constitution in 1827. And here, whereas women had a lot to say about who was running their, their government, they couldn't even vote at this point in time. So we saw a lot of switching there. A lot of advances were made by the Cherokee people coming up to this time in, in regard to language, schooling, religions, just life ways. Uh, and some of this was seen in response to the threat of removal. At this time, the federal government had been talking about removing native peoples on west to have that land available for white people. So some of that response to advancement was the threat of removal. With the discovery of gold in Georgia, that threat became even, even more a reality for the people. Um, in 1830, the Indian Removal Act was uh, established by Congress, and that was to move the people on west. In 1832, the Cherokees fought not to move in the Supreme Court, and they did win. But with President Andrew Jackson, he said, well, John Marshall, one of the Supreme Court justices, he said that uh, we would have that act. He has rendered his decision. Now let's see him enforce it. So essentially, President Jackson then sent in the cavalry for the people. They would come into their houses in the middle of the night, take them out, and corral them like animals in order to get them ready to move on to Oklahoma, or what was then known as Indian Territory. Only about that time had 2,000 families moved before the cavalry started coming in. And what was even more um, added insult was the state of Georgia, specifically. They had a lottery system. So they had already given away the native people's land. And as the soldiers came in to take them away, other families would go ahead and, and move into their house and take all their belongings. So that is, is what had started what is known as the Trail of Tears. We eventually, around this time, had a somewhat of a civil war or two different groups forming within the tribe. One was the progressives. A lot of the members that would be included in this group were the mixed bloods. These were the upper echelon of Cherokee society, the business owning or even slave owning people. They were for adopting white ways, although you did have some full bloods in this group. We also had the traditionalists. These were the more conservative, conservative Cherokees that wanted to keep the traditions alive. And so we saw the two parties forming here. Eventually, the, the progressives, the mixed blood, a small party of them called the Treaty Party was negotiating with the United States. They wanted to comply with this movement west. So they signed the Treaty of New Echota in the year of 1835, which essentially sold out the tribe and the movement was to go west. After they were, were um, after they arrived to Oklahoma, there was a lot of violence happening between the two parties. But I need to first tell you a little bit about the Trail of Tears, or what they called the trail where, where they cried. And what happened was after they interned the people in the corrals, after the cavalry had come in, then they set off these different parties to go west. They started getting people ready and leaving in October, and they didn't arrive to Oklahoma or Indian Territory until March. So and essentially, that was a very bad part of the year. They were supposed to have gotten rations and blankets and other supplies, but a lot of the agents took that and sold it for their own use. 
so the people weren't even prepared to go that far and under those very extreme conditions. Um, one out of four Cherokees going on that Trail of Tears died. They did not make it. And just think of the extreme conditions that you had there. They said that approximately 96 newborns were born by the time they got to Oklahoma. Think about being in that situation and having to, to walk all that way. Essentially, the mixed bloods are the ones that were better well off. Um, they had things like, like horses and wagons and were able to take more of their property. But the ones who were poorer, or usually it was the full bloods, they just had what they had escaped with at that time. So after the arrival to Oklahoma, that was seen after they started rebuilding, rebuilding Cherokee Nation getting their government established again, the mixed bloods flourished at that time. We can see that it's called the golden age because they were again living their Victorian lifestyles, had plantation type homes, the silk dresses, the horses and carriages, um, and they eventually established a school system that is recognized uh, historically as something quite prominent. Uh, in 1846, the National Council of Cherokee Nation established the female and male seminaries. Those are schools that are comparable to today's high schools. So they were established to carry the mental culture of the youth of our country to the highest practical point. So the mixed blood Cherokees, the, the upper class, was really pushing toward the education. And the model for this school system, especially for the female seminary, was Mount Holyoke. In fact, they recruited teachers to come in and teach. So it was still pushing this adoption of the wider European type of lifestyle as being something very valued. The schools were very prominent and, and flourished until 1907 when Oklahoma became a state and at that time the schools were closed and the students or the schools fell upon the jurisdiction of the state and at that point the literacy rate, the schooling rate really plummeted because one advancement of Cherokee Nation was the invention of the syllabary around 1821 by George Guess or he's known even more by the name of Sequoia. And what he did was invent the syllabary or the Cherokee alphabet. And when you see it, you'll see that some of the letters look a lot like the regular alphabet. But instead of having letter to letter, it's letter to sounds. And so with this thread of removal coming around in that time, around, remember, 1821, we saw people become literate. This was a way for them to communicate and perhaps fight this situation. And within two years, approximately 90% of the Cherokee people became literate. So that is quite an accomplishment in terms of even today's literacy rate. Even after the schooling system, I've mentioned now that uh, they were closed upon statehood in 1907. We have to think about the land issues uh, within Indian Territory or what was given to the Cherokee people to be theirs after they were moved west. Cherokee Nation was a communi communal property state until around 1887 when the Dawes Act or the General Allotment Act was, was passed by Congress. What this was was another assimilation move to split up tribal communities, to have everyone become farmers or individual landowners. That was a value back then, that you should own your own and develop it. And so what this did was stop tribal government and, and split up our, our sense of community. Um, a lot of the full bloods resisted this. They did not want to sign on to get on the Dawes Roll to get, get the land you were registered by the Dawes Commission and put on the Dawes Roll. This was a list of people who was Cherokee to receive the land. And a lot of the full bloods resisted. They did not want the mixed bloods to get it or the married in the intermarried whites, the people who had married into the nation. And they, I think, were also resistant because they were wanting information on the people. And I think there was a lot of fear 
that by giving their information, they may be moved again. So that was one sense of resistance. It's also important to know, and what I've heard, that some uh, white people were able to buy their way onto the roll, so they weren't even Cherokee at all. Also, I'm aware of people who passed as white in the southeast, in Georgia, and then upon this giving away of the Don's land, they took a train in to Oklahoma and claimed their land. So they weren't even on the trail of tears or had to suffer that type of tragedy to get their land. So now, in looking at what has happened historically, we have to think about uh, where Cherokee Nation is today and, and why people want to be Cherokee or claim to be Cherokee. Uh, perhaps no tribe has experienced this reclaiming of a native identity that Cherokee Nation has. We are seeing, in a sense, a virtual population explosion in our tribal roles and uh, the, the tribal membership roles. Um, at the close of the Dawes Act in 1907, there was an enrollment of, of blood Cherokees of 31,400. And at that time, only about 28% were full blood. So we already see this issue of mixed identity. Um, also, we're looking at people who were on the Dolls Roll at being only 100, excuse me, 1, 256 Cherokee. So in essentially, how much Indian were they? At that point in time, being Indian was not a good thing. So a lot of people, if they could pass as white, they did. By 1970, we see a growth in enrollment. We had 66,150 people who self-identified according to the U.S. Census that year. That's important that they self-identified. They weren't ne necessarily certified tribal members, when essentially in 1975, only 12,000 people were enrolled with the tribe. And that's when I believe you had to be a quarter or more Cherokee. However, in looking at our tribal growth from 1970 on, that is when the numbers really start leaping. As of April 1st of 1997, the tribe had 182,000 tribal members. What's even more astonishing is in the 1990 U.S. Census, 308,000 people self-identified as Cherokee. So, why have people decided that they want to be Cherokee? What are the things that, that influence them on wanting to lay claim to the tribe? I believe that one of the reasons is because of the deteriorating economic status of the United States. There are some benefits in being Indian. Uh, some people can qualify for health care, perhaps educational grants, uh, perhaps job preference. So those are some, some reasons. We also have, and what I have found, is a sense of pride. We're seeing more people now, um, it's, it's okay to claim that tribal ancestry that it was at one time hidden. We're also seeing perhaps a safer time in history now for people to be Indian, although I have to say not in all areas. We're still seeing a lot of racial turmoil, even to the point of, of murders because of racial difference toward Native Americans. But we see a sense of popularity happening. What were some of the movies that came out more recently? It, it more or less started with The Dances of Wolves, uh, Last of the Mohicans, Pocahontas. So we see an, an increase in popularity. Within the Cherokee Nation, um, some of the reasons that people are laying claim to the tribe, uh, from my point of view, is because of the history of assimilating. We were able to adopt into uh, white ways or, or that type of value system. So in a sense, we were more an acceptable tribe. We weren't some of the warring tribes that we've, we've heard other histories of. So we were more acceptable. Uh, we also have, being on the eastern side of the United States, an earlier history of mixing. So a lot of people can claim to ancestry from the tribe. Also, a lot of people have a sort of romance about the Trail of Tears. It's, it's a, 
a American tragedy or American saga. So we see people who are attracted by that history. So those are some of the reasons that I see people wanting to claim Cherokee heritage. And that's just a bit about my tribe. And the reasons that I shared all of this with you was because I wanted to share some of the diversity of, of Native people. We hear about different tribes and we all have different histories. I also wanted to share with you some of the diversity within our own tribe in issues of identity. Secondly, we need to know because of mixing such as this, you may have clients or people that you sign or interpret for that may not necessarily look Indian, but perhaps they are culturally and in how they identify. You also may have people who look Indian, but don't culturally identify. They may have been removed in some instance from that association with the culture. Third, we need to understand that identity such as this is socially constructed. It's not just a given. There are things historically that happen that shape people or shape groups of people in how they see themselves. Uh, when we're looking at different definitions on who is Indian, we see federal definitions. There was a study in the 1970s looking at the Bureau of Indian Affairs or the BIA. Within that particular entity, there was among 200 different definitions of who was Indian. So we see definitions there. States may have their definitions, schools. Within tribal communities, especially after the Self-Determination Act, tribes then were given the power to determine their own tribal members. And that shifts and changes also. Within communities or families, we also see differences in identity. Uh, one thing to think about in diversity among Native tribes is the term federally recognized. There's approximately 500 or 545 federally recognized tribes, which means these tribes have some sort of agreement or treaty with the United States. Perhaps that was in exchange for resources or the land that was taken. So they have a particular status. There's also hundreds of other tribes. We have many tribes that have that federal recognition. We also have hundreds that are not federally recognized, so they don't have that established uh, relationship with the United States government, nor that responsibility to the tribes. Some of the tribes uh, might be such as the California Mission tribes or the Lumbees of North Carolina. They are the largest with around 40,000 tribal members, although the federal government does not consider them a, a tribe to deal with them on, on that governmental type of level. Um, I have also noticed a difference in definitions on who is Indian among non-Indians and Indians. With non-Indians, I see more of that biological or that genetic ancestry to determine who is an Indian or who is not. It's interesting because I have to carry a tribal membership card or a card from the federal government saying that I am Native American. I don't believe any other ethnic groups do that. It also says what percentage that I am Native American. And to a lot of mixed bloods, that can be a type of, of rude question as to ask, well, how much Indian are you? According to me, my dad raised me to be Cherokee, and that is exclusively how I see myself. Among Indians, there's a difference in definitions in, in what I have heard from other people. Usually, when you talk to them, they'll ask, where are you from? Who is your family? Do you know your language? What traditions or history do you know? Not that you read out of a book, but what do you know? What have you learned? So those are our definitions in who is Indian, the difference between non-Indians and Indians. The fourth reason I told my whole background story is just to give you an idea of the communication style of many Native people. We have to give, in a sense, a circular type of storytelling to you in order to establish the context, give you the background before we wind in to a specific point. 
So that's one reason that I told you my background, my tribal history. Other issues that I will speak of uh, in terms of communication with Native people have come from my own experiences. I worked at the University of Oklahoma in the American Indian Student Services Office. I also worked with a branch in New Mexico State University in grants, so I've had um, interactions with, with Oklahoma Plains tribes, uh, different tribes in Oklahoma, also interactions with the Navajo people, the Acoma, Laguna, uh, Pine Hill Navajo people. And so I'll share with you just some of the specific communication styles, if you will, that I have noticed. And I must establish that all of this is just from my opinion, so you're only getting one side of the story. One of the issues that often comes up is the situation of eye contact with Indian people. And in some ways, some people aren't as ready to look eye to eye with you as others. But that's going to depend on where they were raised, where they're from, and also perhaps age. I have to say, when I communicate with someone, it's very hard for me to maintain eye contact for very long. When I speak, I'm more comfortable if I look at you and then I look at some other object or, or another point to look at and then kind of gaze back and forth. That's more comforting for me. I guess I could maintain a strict eye contact if someone really aggravated me, but I prefer not to. Uh, another situation is um, handshakes. When you meet someone, a lot of times in the mainstream culture, we think that a very firm handshake is what is ideal. Among some Indian people, it's almost uh, just to the point of shaking fingers with someone. It's very light. Uh, the issue of silence is another communication situation that I noticed. With different Native people, silence is something that is valued. You have a point of silence after someone quits talking to think about something, give another person the opportunity to join into the conversation. Interrupting someone is seen as something that is rude. And I have to say, even with my interactions in meetings or, or various social uh, interactions, if someone starts talking when I'm talking, I'm more apt to stop, to, to stop my own conversation. It's, it's just not comfortable for me to do that. I wait until there is a point for me to re-enter the conversation. Being reserved, that is a term that I've also heard. Um, Native American people are very reserved or kept to themselves. And I'm not sure if that is something inherent within the culture or because of contact in situations of racism that it's almost type of, uh, for some people, a protective mechanism. Um, being reserved, it's, it's not ideal to be boastful or put yourself out front with others. It's, it's nicer to be somewhat reserved. And for me, I like to wait and kind of observe a situation before I start interacting with people. I know when I was taking classes, time would also pass several classes before I would really enter in class discussions. I wanted to observe and see what, how other people were going to act first. Upon being reserved, a lot of people think that Native American people are very, very quiet. But humor is another communicative way of getting to know someone or interacting. And I have to say with Indian people, that is one thing that I, I really like is the sense of humor. And when I first started my job in grants, where I was now in a Native community that I didn't know about with the different groups, that's one way that I got to know people. When people would come by, they would kind of check me out before they'd come into my office. But after people did, it was especially for those who were younger than me to start teasing them uh, some way as a way to get to know someone. And so the sense of humor of Indian people is something that is very consistent and evident once you find it. I also learned with my interactions with people of after having interactions for just a little while, I could figure out 
if they were someone who was less aggressive or more aggressive and I would also kind of alter my style to them. And that, as I finish, would like to speak about the situation of intuition when you do meet someone. Uh, in the mainstream world, we have been kind of taught to ignore this intuition that we have. We're supposed to use logic, what is verifiable, what is objective when we interact with someone. But what about that feeling that you have? I have a feeling in which gives me information to interact with someone, and that is usually uh, the truer than just watching and, and seeing how it's going to go. I like to know or, or trust those feelings that I have. So as interpreters, that is something that I encourage you also to use. Yeah, 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 yeah